Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with me today as we give you what we anticipate will be the last update about our mass murder that occurred on Sunday. The, before I start, there's been a lot of interest in wanting to help the family, and quite frankly, the family needs help. As you know, an, an entire family was wiped out at one time. And we've got an 11-year-old that's at Tampa General, so we have hospital bills and everything that's related to that, as well as funeral bills, as well as two homes that have been destroyed. And to quote one of the uncles that's working closely with a family, I never had a class in high school to help me deal with this. As you can well imagine that we have our crime victim teams working with the family. And there are four uh, sites that have been set up, GoFundMe sites. One of those is a suspicious site. We are determining whether or not it's valid at this time. And GoFundMe is a business, so they have to have a percentage of the money in order to function and operate. If a lot of people will donate a little money and they'll send it to Polk Sheriff Charities, 100% of that donation, there is no administrative fee, 100% of that donation will go to the family. And when you hit the site, when you search up Polk Sheriff Charity, they'll, it'll also give you a drop-down box that will say quadruple homicide. However, any donations that come in will go, if you happen to drop it in the wrong box or put it in a general box, all of those donations will go to the family. So 100%. So before I start and give you the update, I wanted to make sure that, that I did that because once again, we have a family that is going through a horror right now that no one should ever have to go through. But I wanted to update you as I told you that I would. The big question has been, what's the nexus? How did this evil person by the name of Riley find these victims? And we think we have the solution to that. It hasn't changed in that there was no relationship between our victims and Riley. There was no relationship. Brian didn't know them in advance. But here's what happened. We found a witness who lives in the area of North Socrum Loop Road, and he said that he was talking to Brian Riley. He knows him. And Riley told him, hey, I'm going to go out with the Hurricane Ida relief assistance. And I offered to make him up a first aid kit. And he, we were working together. And he said, great. Now, I said, come by the house and I'll give you the first aid kit. Well, we can document that mass murderer Riley was at his friend's house picking up the first aid kit at about 6.45 p.m. on Saturday. We can also document that he left there about 7.10 p.m., so about 25 minutes later, he left the friend's house. Just after 7.10 p.m., understanding that we got the call of a suspicious person and vehicle at 722. Sometime in that period, that's when Brian Riley stopped out in front and talked to Justice, who was mowing his yard, one of our homicide victims. And that's when he said, hey, God said that I need to talk to Amber because she's going to commit suicide. And Justice said, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no one here by the name of Amber. But old murderer Riley pressed on. 
no, I'm not leaving until I talk to Amber. And the guy says, hey, dude, we don't know any Amber. So in the meantime, the mother-in-law is called out and said, who is also a homicide victim, and says, look, mister, we don't know who you are, but we can assure you there's no Amber here. Now, during this period of time where justice is mowing the yard and our murder suspect stops, we also know by an interview with the 11-year-old little girl who's a victim at Tampa General, she was in the yard with her dad. So our murder suspect, Brian Riley, had the opportunity to see a little girl in the yard. So Justice left mad. I'm sorry. Justice told him to leave. The mother-in-law said, you need to leave right now. We're going to call the cops. They notified law enforcement. He drove off mad, as we found out later. Never did Brian Riley make a threat. Never. He just wanted to talk to Amber because he thought she was going to commit suicide. Just a bizarre, irrational statement, but no threats of violence. Now we know, as I give you a compilation of, of interviews, that... When our suspect Riley left, he was very angry. And he was very angry at Justice because he thought Justice had kept him from seeing this child, Amber, that was going to commit suicide. And that's when Brian Riley, our suspect, our murder suspect, said, God told me to kill everyone and to rescue Amber because she's a victim of sex trafficking. So he goes home. He decides to put an ops plan together. In his confession, he says, well, you know what that means? It means you have to kill everyone. And I told you the other day how he arrived at home. He argued with his girlfriend of four years, but never mentioned violence. The girlfriend said, God doesn't talk to you in this way. He accused her of being a non-believer. He got angry. He went to his room. She went to bed. I explained that to you. And she woke up at 6.30 and he was gone. In the neighborhood, we have found a piece of video where at 1 o'clock in the morning, he left his residence in that truck that we found at the scene, the black Ford pickup truck, F-150, with a large, carrying a large shoulder bag, if you will, about 1 in the morning. So we wondered, where has he been between 1 in the morning and 4.22 in the morning? Well, here's a rendition, once again, of information that we were told based upon a, the interview with Brian Riley. He told us that when he left the residence, he went back to North Socrum Loop Road and he did reconnaissance. And I'm going to use terminology that he used. And the terminology that he used is from some of his training, some of his executive training, some of his security training. He said, I went back to do reconnaissance outside of the house in the moonlight. And he says, and that was the, and, and that was, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if he said that, but that was the beginning of his execution plan. He told us, and I'm going to read some snippets here, that he repositioned his truck three times so that he would have a fast departure. 
he searched through and spent time at the house to locate three entrance points into the homes. He planned out his diversions and he prepared his exit strategy. He slashed the tires on both a sedan and the pickup truck he ultimately set on fire. He set out the glow sticks from the road next to his vehicle through the backyard close to the next house. He explained that those were so he could find his way out in an emergency at night and so if he found Amber, she could find her way to escape from this house where she was a sex crime victim. This is all fiction, all made up by him. Understand, and I underscore, when we make those references, there was no victims of sex crime in that house. He doused the vehicles on, on, with gasoline, both the sedan and the truck. He set the truck on fire as a diversion. He said, by the time I got back to the car, it wouldn't catch on fire, but the mission was underway and I had to push through. He took his breaching tools and he took them around back to the grandmother's apartment and he tried the breaching tools without success on the door. So he left that door after shooting through the door and he went around to the south side of the apartment and he shot through the window and he entered. He called it clearing the house. I cleared the house and that's when he killed the grandmother as he was clearing the house. He was clearing the house and looking for Amber. He said, I dumped a mag. And what he meant was he shot a whole magazine toward the victim and getting into the house. He said, then I had to immediately reset. And, and this, once again, more, more tactical terms. I had to reset to start my methodical search for Amber in the main house. He entered the main house by shooting out or breaking out the back, back glass door. He said, I know I made a lot of noise, so I had to push through. I knew that, th that they were now aware I was there. He says, I moved down into the fatal funnel, which was not just a fatal funnel, but it was also the hallway through the house. He said, but God told me I was protected. He said, I moved into the bedroom where I shot the dog two times. And they asked him, was the dog aggressive? And he said, no, it was very passive. The dog showed, created no resistance at all. He said, then I cleared the hallway. And then I went to the bathroom and I shot through the bathroom door and I tried to push in. And they pushed back and I shot through the door some more. I then entered the bathroom where he shot and killed Justice. Justice was trying to keep him out. That was the resistance he was seeing on the other side. Once he killed Justice, he shot the 33-year-old the significant other or of Justice and the three-month-old baby killing them. But everyone was in the bathroom huddling and hiding. That's when he grabbed the 11-year-old victim, took her from 
the bedroom, I'm sorry, from the bathroom into the living room. And he asked her, where's Amber? He says, she says, I'm not Amber. There is no Amber. And he said, I want to know who Amber is. And he counted down, three, two, one, pow. And he shot her in the thigh area, in the stomach. And she said, and I grabbed the wound. And he asked me again and shot me again. Then this evil human being told us, I tortured her in order to investigate and, and find, in order to find Amber. This is the big bad dude that tortured an 11-year-old child and murdered a three-month-old baby. And the three-month-old baby's mother and father. And then, then this guy says to the 11-year-old, do you know why I killed your parents? They're sex traffickers. And then he said next, I shot her in the legs. And then when she wouldn't tell me where Amber was, I eliminated her. He thought he'd killed her. But this 11-year-old was very brave and very smart. And she outthought him, thank God. She said, I played dead and I prayed. And that's the reason she's alive today. Before he shot her, thinking he'd killed her whenever she played dead, the suspect told us, I asked God if a 12-year-old could be involved in sex trafficking, and God told me yes, and that's when I killed her. After that was when he had the shootout, the first shootout, and that one was with Lieutenant Tompkins, who came in the back door. And then he had more shootouts with our deputies as they arrived. We believe at this point in the investigation and as I told you before, anything I tell you is subject to change by the time we finish the investigation, but this is the best information we have at this moment in time. We believe that during the subsequent shootout is when one of the deputies who was shooting one of our rifles shot him through the stomach. It was a side-to-side -side wound. It actually went through his, through the vest he was wearing, and but it did not enter the cavity. It just went through the exterior portion of his stomach and through the fat area. He immediately retreated back of all places to the baby's nursery. Where where you would think everyone would be safe and secure. And he started putting quick clot or material to stop the bleeding. After he did that, he told us, he said, well, I knew at that point I was outgunned and outmanned, so I dumped my bulletproof vest in my guns and I walked outside with my hands up and gave up. That's right, he didn't want to die. He didn't want to die. He consciously and intentionally decided, well, heck, they're all here now. They've engaged me once at the back door. They've shot me through the window. 
I better give up. He was a coward. An absolute coward. He looks like a man, but he's not a man. He's a sniveling coward. He was a big bad dude when he had two different firearms and broke into a grandmother's home and shot and murdered an unarmed grandmother. He was a bad dude when armed with three firearms went into this house and shot and killed a three-month-old baby in the arms of its mother and executed the mother with multiple gunshots. When he killed and executed the father with multiple gunshots. He was a big bad dude when he took an 11-year-old child and shot her while trying to interrogate her to find Amber. He was a big bad guy. But then when he got shot by the good guys, he falls up. He drops his vest and his guns he wants when he exits the house to make sure that we all know he's not armed. And our deputies did exactly as they should have. They took him into custody. We got him emergency medical help. Then he got to the hospital and tried to take one of the Lakeland police officers' guns. And they had to fight with him at the hospital. And then he confessed. He confessed to the horrible tragedy that he did on a Sunday morning. Here's what we know at this point in the investigation. Now understand crime scene is still working will not be finished today, probably tomorrow, maybe through the rest of the week. This is the most extensive single crime scene that we have worked that I can remember. It appears at this point the investigation, five deputies shot that morning in response to this mass murderer and one Lakeland police officer. We shot approximately 59 times. We know that our mass murderer shot in excess of 100 times this particular morning. We know, based upon what we've found so far, we're starting to do background work by some of the detectives that our suspect, as you already know, had four years in the Marines, three years in the Reserves, a trip to Afghanistan and Iraq. He worked in executive and private security and was well thought of and was well trained. He has 16 separate certificates in security and tactical training. He was well trained. We know from a compilation of the information from the time he had that first communication with Justice that he was seeking out Amber who wanted to commit suicide who was the victim of sex trafficking and it was all a figment of his imagination. We've had the opportunity to interview the 11-year-old. I can't underscore enough her bravery. I can't underscore enough her ability to think through of how to survive when she has just witnessed her father her baby brother and her stepmother viciously murdered in her right before her very eyes. We interviewed her and she said I was outside helping dad do yard work on a Saturday afternoon. He was mowing. 
I went in the house as he was having a conversation with a man outside. And Dad told me later that it, he was looking for somebody by the name of Amber who, he, who this guy thought was going to commit suicide. She said, I was asleep in my bed when Dad woke me up and took me to the bathroom to hide me. And I was there when they killed my dad, my brother, and my stepmom. He then took me to the living room. I was trying to crouch down behind, beside a cabinet and the toilet. And that's when he called me Amber, and I told him, I'm not Amber. And he said, three, two, one, and he shot me. And I held the wound. And he asked me about Amber again, and I told him, I, I don't know an Amber. And he shot me again in the hand. And he asked me where Amber was, and he shot me again. And then he told me, do you know why I killed your parents? It's because they're sex traffickers. She says, I played dead and I prayed. We know that she's had four surgeries so far. She's in intensive care. She was able to give us a good statement, but she didn't even recall all the additional gunshot wounds she received at this initial interview. We know she has at least seven bullet holes in her. And once again, because of her medical care, we don't know if it's seven separate shots or if it's seven, if it's a total of seven holes and some of them may be in and out shots. She shot in the hand, in the legs, in the thigh, and into the abdominal cavity. but she's alive. And how she survived that is truly a God thing. He thought he left her for dead, but she was way smarter than he was. And God truly was with that little girl that evening. You know, my editorial comment is, I know my God, and my God is pissed. That's not the God we know. But he gave God all the reason for him doing this. God told me to do it. God told me to do it. Well, I'm kind of like his girlfriend. No, God didn't tell you to do that. But he did it and blamed it on God. That's what we know now. We're still at the crime scene. We're still interviewing people. We have found other witnesses that knew he was going to the hurricane recovery. No one yet has told us they knew anything about any violence. No one said that. The investigation's ongoing, as you well know, the investigation is not near over, but now we're going to witnesses and friends and doing dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and this is going to go on for weeks and weeks and weeks as we prepare a case against this mass murder, against this totally evil person. Totally e evil, evil, totally, totally, totally evil. There's not words to adequately describe the rage and the that we all feel about what he did to this innocent family who's simply sleeping in their home. And they happen to be the unfortunate ones that he passed by that afternoon where he saw the man and an 11-year-old girl. 
It could have been anybody's neighborhood that was out with their children that afternoon. These just happened to be the unfortunate people that he picked on. Now you kind of understand why I asked for a lot of people just to help a little bit because they, what is remaining, an, an entire family with the exception of this 11-year-old child is wiped out. And there's funeral bills and doctor's bills and all kinds of collateral issues that have to be dealt with. The family's doing the best they can. We are working with them with our crime victims folks. But they can use help. Are there any questions I may ask, answer them, or I may not? Yes, ma'am. You had said that um, Riley said he was using meth. Have you found any evidence that he was using drugs? We, Riley told on his way to the hospital to a Lakeland police officer among his rambling statements that he had used meth. That's his statements. We haven't gone back yet to see whether that's accurate or if that's some of his ramblings. We have found evidence of illegal steroid use. But obviously we'll, we'll go back and serve subpoenas on the hospital and see what they found when he got there and all of that's yet to be determined. But he admitted it. But we have found evidence of illegal drug use, steroids. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How many firearms were recovered at the scene? We recovered three firearms at the scene. Has he shown any remorse? No. Zero. Zero remorse. He's an evil human being. And and I, I just can't get over how bad he was while he's wearing bulletproof garb with three guns in a house with innocent people trying to sleep at night, none of which had a gun. There were no guns in the house. They couldn't protect themselves if they wanted to. Yes, ma'am. That's, that will be part of the investigations. We don't have any information at this time about, about medicines that he might have been on or should have been on. You said Riley shot his weapon 100 times, was that? 100 plus times. Okay, that was total. The victim and law enforcement? No. We know Riley shot 100 plus times and we're still counting. We're still doing our forensics at the scene and our investigation. We know we shot approximately 59 times. And I say approximately, there's a chance it might have been 60, there's a chance it might have been 58. That's still under investigation. We know he shot 100 plus times throughout the evening. And Riley's girlfriend confirmed he only noticed strange behavior days before the incident? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. He. The, in our initial conversation with her, she's been his girlfriend for four years. She has been totally cooperative, had zero knowledge, according to what she's told us, of any bizarre behavior up until he did the security a week ago Sunday at the church and he came back with this infatuation about being able to speak directly to God and God talk directly back. She said, I'd seen, you know, slight depressions over the years, and even then, never has he been violent toward, toward me or threatened violence. Even that week where she said, I saw bizarre conduct, no threats of violence according to what she's told us. Yes, ma'am. Do you all know if um, Riley went to that church as a security guard or if that is a church 
No, he was sent there to just as a security job along with another individual who, who was his friend who went as well. And in fact, that friend said, I was very pleased that he seemed to be developing a relationship, a religious relationship with God. He, we are still investigating that. We are not telling what church it is at this point in time because obviously we'd like to talk to the people before y'all do. Okay? Thank y'all very much. I appreciate it. Take care. Keep this family in your prayers. It is, uh, this mass mur murder is exceptionally horrible. Exceptionally horrible. As And I'll end where I began. The thought that you would have an active shooter and a mass murder in a home at 422 on a Sunday morning in a nice neighborhood is just something you can't wrap your mind around. But it happened. Take care.